Welcome to The Third Space. This is a show we talk to innovators and tastemakers from all around the Bay Area. Why The Third Space? Well, outside of the home and office, the coffee shop is The Third Space. We ask our guests to take us to their favorite coffee shops where we have amazing conversation over coffee. Hi, my name is Faiza Farah and I'll be your host. So how do you take your coffee? I like a little cream and just a tiny, tiny bit of sugar. I really love that. So San Francisco is your home now. How do you like As it? As of, I, I, I like it. As of, uh, we moved, um, going on, we're in our second year now. So it hasn't really even been that long. It feels like it's always been home, but it hasn't really been that long. Yeah. Has it changed much since the time that you... In the two years? Yeah. You know, I think that we kind of moved to San Francisco right at the, you know, right kind of at the height of it really changing. Mm. So to me, this is the only San Francisco I know. <laughs> um, I hear that it was extremely different, mm. and uh, but I hear different. I hear different stories from different people. You know, I, I know it's becoming more of a tech city. It kind of always has been. I know there's a mass exodus of people that are leaving because the city is becoming, you know, more and more um, inaccessible for people of color, sure. people of limited means. But you know. I might have a really limited understanding of San Francisco, but I sort of like look around and look at my bubble. I look at you, I look at my friends, I look at like, you know, my work and my husband and his friends. And it just feels like what we wanted to create here. It feels like we have a sense of community in San Francisco. We have that creative outlet. We have like the consciousness that we were seeking. Like we, we have that, you know, and every city has its challenges. Right, it's sure. not perfect, yeah. you know. Um, but I'd rather be here than, you know, than anywhere else, really. At this point in my life, I'd rather be. This is this feels like the best fit for us, for my husband and I. Yeah. yeah. When did you open your shop? We opened Relove exactly a year ago. It was one year. So we were in San Francisco for a year and then immediately after that we opened the, we opened the shop. And wow. so it's been a year since it's been open now. Yeah, I can't believe it's been a year. Just the time has just flown by. And um what were some in you know what were some of the challenges in opening a business i can't imagine like moving to a place right and then <laughs> finding a, an apartment mm -hmm, here mm -hmm. which is a feat unto itself in its own girl <laughs> i know <laughs> and and then opening a business right. yeah you know it's funny like in retrospect, I think if I look back, I'm like, how is it that we did that? That like we got married and then we quit our jobs and like you know put everything in storage and moved across the state and you know found an apartment, got settled here and like opened a business. Like I don't I don't know how we did that, wow. except to say that I think that like once you're in this like trajectory, once you have a really clear vision of what you want, um, like a really clear vision, right? Then it's so much easier to walk towards it. You know, so we weren't. We didn't feel lost in our like search. We knew exactly what we wanted to cultivate in San Francisco. We knew, you know, roughly around like what area we wanted to live in, what we wanted to bring out in ourselves. What you really had a clear vision. Really of, clear vision. Like, opening a shop, and he knew exactly what he wanted to do in San Francisco. You yeah. Knew where you wanted to live before you yeah. got here. Yeah, we did. Wow. I know. That's impressive. <laughs> No wonder! We're a good team! <laughs> <laughs> so I think that made it a lot, I think that made it, I don't want to say it made it easier, but I think it made it possible, right? It's like we knew what we wanted to do and anything else that sort of didn't fit into that kind of got dismissed and we were kind of going for this clear vision. And I think something happens when you, uh, you know, have a really amazing partner, which I have, and it's like it's two people something happens with that magic you know and it's just like things are just easier to create and there's just this sort of like it feels like the two of us is like an army you know it's right. not just two people like it's like the sum of the two of us feels like we could accomplish so much more is is relove um your first very first business it is my first business yeah wow yeah <laughs> it is and again like i had um a really clear vision of what i wanted the the business to be and, and what was what was that vision i definitely knew i wanted to be 
in the vintage clothing industry, right? And, and not just specifically vintage, I wanted it to be secondhand for several reasons. One is just the way that I approach fashion is I wear almost all secondhand clothing. I go to thrift stores, I go, you know what I mean? And so to me, like having a sense of personal style, like real personal style, not what the magazines tell you that you should wear, but your own personal style, comes from going to one of a kind places and sort of, you know, picking what speaks to you rather than what you're told you should buy, you know? Sure. I knew that I wanted it to be roughly around 1,500 square feet because I wanted it to feel big enough to have a selection but small enough to feel really curated. Um, I knew that I wanted it to feel like a space when you walk into that, that kind of created the sense of like, ah, like just ease and like, you know, just an easy feeling. Also really love design, so I wanted it to be designed really beautifully. And I also just, I, I wanted to have a selection of vintage and designer and current trend. Um, and then when I was putting together a business plan, I got really specific. I'm so impressed by yeah. this. It's so amazing. I love vintage clothing, but your clothes don't feel costumey. Mm, you know, it, mm -hmm. it looks and feels very wearable. Mm -hmm. And it's um, vintage clothing, but mm -hmm. I feel like I could throw on an entire outfit and be in this present moment and not feel like this is a 1960s totally, get up. You know? yes, totally, yeah. Is that intentional? Totally intentional. Totally intentional. And and I and I agree with you. I think you walk into a lot of vintage places and it feels like you've walked into a decade. And that's not mm. That doesn't feel, I mean, and, and there are some people that can pull off period sure. pieces perfectly, yeah. but does it translate in a modern way for a modern person? Yeah. Not to me, you know? So yeah, I wanted the clothes to feel, and, and you've got to remember too, like any modern trend that you find is somehow influenced by something that's been done in the past right. and better, right? <laughs> the quality. The quality yeah. is better. <laughs> so it's about like finding those pieces that are speaking to current trend, but are also really from a different era. I think about um, the idea of style, mm. um, and I, I do think it is something that's really instinctual. I think it's something that either people have or they don't. But how does one cultivate style? Mm. You know, I think one of the main reasons for why people kind of follow the trends that are in the magazines is, is right. that it's not something that is instinctual. Right. So, so how does one cultivate style if it isn't something that comes naturally? To right, you, you that's know? such a great question. And you know, it's so much deeper than just like going into a store and buying. You have to have a sense of self-confidence about mm -hmm. you. And you have to like give yourself permission to express yourself, right? right? Not giving yourself permission to go to the first store that you see and buying what's on display. Anybody, right. anybody could do that. You know, that's like that's not. That looks good. That looks good. Perfect. I'll take that. I'll take that in a two. Um, it's so much different, and I think one of the re one of the things that I think you should do if you're trying to cultivate a personal style is go to a one of a kind store. Meaning, you know, a resale store, a vintage store, a thrift store, and just see what speaks to you. What speaks right. to Faiza? You know, like, because then you're not sort of presented these things that say, bye, 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 bye. Sure. You're not a Zara where there's a billboard that says, this is the thing that you should buy this season. Right. You know, you are more kind of like seeing what calls you, what mm -hmm. colors call you, what mm -hmm. silhouettes call you. And then if you kind of go from there, if you approach it from that angle of like, what, what do I want to wear rather than what are people telling me to wear? you'll have a sense of what you like. And then from there, expand on what you like, right? What is it? Is it like, you know, really strong sort of ethnic pieces that speak to you? Is it really clean lines that speak to you? Is it, what speaks to you? Right. And I think you have to sort of have a sense of who you are in order sure. to approach that. So I find that people that have really honed personal style are just a lot more confident in who they are. They're, they know themselves a lot better. They care less about trend. Sure. They're, I find them to be a lot more self-aware. Mm -hmm. um, and not waiting for permission. Not waiting for permission, you totally, know, It's yeah. like sometimes there's something that you gravitate to that isn't on trend, that isn't the stuff that everyone else is wearing, and you don't feel like you're allowed to wear it. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. Um, you know, I've lived in cities, and there are cities in the world where where no matter what age you are, you're very conscious about the clothes that you put mm. on. Because you, 
you realize that you add to the visual aesthetic of the city. Right. You know? Do you think San Francisco is a stylish city? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, people care about it's what they so wear? funny. Um, I think there are a lot of stylish people in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. As a city in general, I think it's really shifting towards more sort of uh, conventional, like dressing, sure. uh, practical dressing, um, that is a little bit more muted mm -hmm. and a lot more. I mean, San Franciscans care about quality too. It's like you know, there's like they're denim freaks, for example. There's a <laughs> lot of people that are really, really into their denim, but there are a lot of amazing, like really fashion forward, really mm -hmm. forward thinking um, people that have honed personal style in San Francisco. I think fashion is like a, a beautiful visual art, you mm -hmm. know, and, and and just looking at your outfit, it's like it's a wearable art as mm -hmm. well, you mm -hmm. know. Um, what do you think about the state of fashion right now? More specifically, tell me. I'm always really curious about like the lack of black designers, mm. you know, the prominence of black designers, and I'm curious what you think mm -hmm. about that. You know, Faiza, I don't follow fashion trend. Mm. I don't watch the fashion shows. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, it, does, it doesn't really it doesn't yeah. speak to me. It's not my narrative. <laughs> it's very whitewashed. Mm -hmm. It lacks diversity. Yeah. It's very sexist in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's very ageist. Mm -hmm. It makes women really body conscious. I don't it doesn't speak to me. It's not yeah. a medium where I get a lot of inspiration, which sounds crazy for somebody <laughs> in my industry. But you know, I, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, and people ask me like, you know, oh, what's, what's your favorite designer and all of these things. And it always goes back to like what was happening in the 50s and 60s yeah. when, like, you know, when people really felt liberated enough to create rather than to have this pressure to just crank things out that are going to sell, 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 right. sell, sell, sell every season. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, now there's like, you know, the fast fashion stores have like 56 seasons. So they're just like literally telling you that you need to just give them your money and buy crap. And it's just so horrible for the environment. A lot of these clothes are produced in places with really poor condition. So it's just, I get excited when I see a lot of fashion innovation coming out of West Africa. There's a lot of amazing mm -hmm. things happening in Nigeria in terms of like, when, when things like that happen, I get excited. But your run of the mill average New York Fashion Week, I can't be fucking bothered. I really can't. <laughs> I, I mean, you don't want to be you know fun, I mean? though, is it? <laughs> well, that's not what I want to be. That's not where I want to be. I want to be where there's personal style. And like all yeah. these celebrities are getting all these clothes and they're getting them for free. I mean, they're literally <laughs> just giving it to them so that they yeah. could just be marketed. Walking. Yeah. I have been known to do this mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. oh, often, no. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> no, but like seeing something on sale, neat, like feeling the urgency to have it and then never wearing it again. Right. And seeing that is completely unsustainable for totally. our environment, for, you know, our, our own like pockets. Right. And this idea of reloving clothes that already exist, yes. you know, and, right. and being able to kind of curate that for yourself is right. so important. I did not see it as a kind of you know, ecological sustainability oh, issue. Oh, completely, it is. I mean, there's a lot of lack of awareness about exactly what the damage is that we're doing yeah. by buying all these clothes. I think people are being a lot more aware about what they eat in terms of, you know, organic foods and staying away from GMOs and mm -hmm. things like that. But they really are not aware about what the impact is of when you shop at a shop like Forever 21. Like, right. if that shirt is $6, do you know the cost of that shirt? The true cost the of it. The true cost of that shirt. The yeah. environmental cost, the economic cost of the places where they are being produced. I mean, the it's labor The labor issues. cost, it's terrible, yeah. literally terrible. And all they're doing with these fast fashion stores, and I'll call out H&M, Zara, Forever 21, Uniqlo, I mean, there's all of these companies that are just like producing all of this shit. I mean, literally many seasons throughout the year to just make that. you feel like you buy something and immediately the next season it's out of style and you need the next thing and you need the next thing. It used to be just traditionally just two seasons, <laughs> four, four seasons at max. You know, people are just like buying these clothes without any awareness. And I see conscious people yeah, being trapped in this. I think we're conscious about 
food. Yes. I think we're conscious about kind of environmental products. You yes. know, I have all of the like organic dish soap yes. and, you know, detergent. Paraben free. <laughs> exactly. And yes. uh -huh. Right. Everything from like makeup to the food that we eat. Mm -hmm. But bringing this, that level of consciousness to the clothes that we wear yes. is, is something that I'm embarrassed to say I, I hadn't really thought of before. Right. Well, I think that's intentional. I think that that information is intentionally withheld from us. And mm. I think if people really had that information about where the clothes are produced, how they're produced, who's producing them, the, what is the environmental impact? If they had all of this complete information, just like you would a piece of meat that you're eating. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're in San Francisco, you can ask what the cow's name was. <laughs> what was this cow's name? Did it live a happy life? <laughs> Did it have brothers and sisters? <laughs> Do you know? Did it have separation anxiety? You know, the level of detail that people ask about the love, like the food that they can, as they should. Right. I yeah, think you should absolutely. be very conscious about absolutely. what you put in your body. But zero awareness mm. about, you know, that same person can go into an H&M and buy a t-shirt for $8, not right. knowing exactly what the impact is. Right. If your clothes had a label, just like your food had a label, about where it's produced, oh my God. who produced it. Can you Horror. imagine? Can you imagine? <laughs> I would not buy a single new no, thing. No, you wouldn't. If I actually knew the true cost of it, I'd right. probably stop buying new clothes. And that sometimes, you know, the chemicals that are used, that also then, then you're putting on your body, right. you know? Right. So when I was a kid, I loved show and tell. It was like my favorite thing mm -hmm. um, preschool. Um, and the items I usually brought were like, live well they used to be live like <laughs> they'd be like light bugs or butterflies or caterpillars and i put them mm -hmm. in a jar and poke holes and bring them to my class Aww. like whip them out of my bag and they usually was dead. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um after the teacher was like you have to stop doing this i started bringing other stuff and it makes me think about like you know what as adults are like our most prized possessions or things that we mm. want to show off and and yeah and uh, represent who we are in some way. So, right, right. What did you bring for us? Well, um, I didn't bring anything <laughs> sentimental or dead um, or alive. I brought this <laughs> coat that I'm really excited about. Oh, it's um, beautiful. I recently went to an estate sale and I found this. Oh, I love that. And it's just this big wool wow. cocoon. <laughs> it's a cocoon. I love army green. I, I love, love things army that are green. like yeah. yeah. I love things that are like just and it's like made in France for Neiman Marcus. And yeah, I really love it. And I ended up just getting rid of four coats out of my closet just so I can keep this. Remember I was telling you just the revolving thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So this Absolutely. is my new favorite thing that's in my closet right now. I love it. And and it seems easy to wear. It's, it seems like a easy uh, piece. Oh, totally. Just kind of to throw it on and just like yeah, cover it up. And it's oversized. I love things that are just like huge and oversized statement pieces. And I love this thing. I That's love my it. show and tell. Thanks. That's, that's <laughs> great. That's really great. <laughs> hey guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, like, subscribe, and share our YouTube channel. And also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram.